to the cloud. That way anybody who joins will know that they're being recorded at least. And that way we can just upload this to uh, YouTube when we're done and be like, look, impromptu, whatever's fun. Oh. So you're wearing a suit, Chris? This is my, this is, it's not a suit, technically. I have the, uh, the nice pants and shoes and this is Adam and Brendan, who are my colleagues, can attest that every day, <laughs> um, this is how I show up. James has seen me on enough calls recently. He knows. I used to work with a guy who wore a bow tie every day to work. And then one day, <clears throat> he showed up in a t-shirt. And who are my so, well, Tom Dale has not been showing up in suits this year, and it's been really it, strange. Yeah. We've been like, Tom, are you are you feeling okay? okay. All right, I think we've got enough people. We can start doing fun things. So here's how we'll do this for folks who just topped on. Feel free to drop a question in chat or to raise your hand if you want to uh, ask via microphone, etc. And since David Baker is the one who roped me into the issue, told, you. <laughs> told me get do an AMA, Chris. I'm like, okay, okay, I'll do it. Uh, he'll say, you know, go, etc. To whoever wants to ask. So people start throwing out questions, and I will try to answer. James may try to answer. If it's Glint specific, I'm probably going to make James answer because he helped implement it. I just got to be a really, really uh enthusiastic rubber duck that's how i'm describing my involvement with clint so far it's a little more than that i did help with the types sometimes along the way but i've mostly been an enthusiastic rubber duck so questions insults for our work we accept those as well How soon do you think Glint will start landing more active, or how to put it? Yeah. Is this become an experiment less experimental. for the community, or will it become less experimental? And when do you think that will happen? So, our goal is certainly for it to become less experimental. It is currently experimental, mostly in the fact that, you know, it's one thing to have it running on some small demo code bases. Um, and I know Dan and James have worked on it a bit on the Salsify code base, tried it out, et cetera. But it's another thing entirely to say, okay, CrowdStrike and LinkedIn and Olo and everybody else out there in the community who uses it. I just grabbed three three names right off the top of my head who are also TypeScript users. Try this out and see what the issues are. The other piece of it is um, we have a goal as the Typed Ember team, and we've always been explicit about this, but we have a goal that all the infrastructure we build, whether that's types, whether that's tooling like Glint, anything else, uh, always ends up being a net positive for the entire Ember community. So whether you use TypeScript or not, we want the work we're doing on the official TypeScript RFC to benefit you. Where, and likewise with Glint, our goal is, and there's an engineer, another engineer from LinkedIn who's signed up and chugging away at this work. We want Glint to work with pure JavaScript apps um, where there's no TypeScript in sight um, because our goal is to make it so that Glint and then anything else we build, again, is a net positive to, if you're a plain JavaScript user who hates TypeScript, that's fine. We don't, like, that's fine. Uh, we, we like TypeScript, but we don't think everybody needs to. But we want the work we do to never be, especially never to be a net loss, but as much as possible to be a net benefit to the ecosystem, TypeScript or not. Those are two long ways of saying that's why it's still experimental. Like JavaScript support basically doesn't exist yet. And we don't yet have a good design for how to make it exist that uh, works robustly with plain JavaScript. Um, Aaron Singer from LinkedIn is working on that. We're also probably going to take some inspiration from the kind of heuristics based model that LifeArt did in building the unstable Ember language server typed templates plugin, which does work with plain old JavaScript. Um, 
So we're, we're probably going to take some inspiration there if there's code we can use there. Ultimately, we want to basically take all the kind of language server style efforts that exist out there and merge them all into a single effort. It's kind of doing the, the normal Ember thing where there's like, let's all experiment, let's try different approaches, let's take the best part of this one and that one, et cetera, and fold them all together into something awesome. We're in the lots of experiments out there phase of that. And we're identifying the things that will help us close the gap. And there are some key technical things in Ember's roadmap that will help here. Whatever the final syntax for template imports ends up being, Glint will support that. But having template imports and strict mode for templates gets us a lot of things for free. So right now, if you look at what, the way Glint works, like you have to go, if you're working with an Ember Octane app, you have to go define a registry that says this name maps to this component on disk. And that's because Ember's conventional layout is basically invisible to TypeScript. And when you're going to resolve a component, you know, my button, uh, you just have a string that we're trying to know how to resolve. It's not, it's not a value in the type layer like you might think it would be. You know, we've just parsed the string. Um, Thank you, James. Do see the link in chat. You've just parsed a string, you know, parsing the Glimmer AST, and now we have to go try to figure out, like, where does that even live on disk? What component file is that talking about? So you have to go write a file, or at the bottom of your component definition, a file that says, given this name, here's the file that it corresponds to, the backing class that it corresponds to, etc. Strict mode will make that not a thing, because it'll you'll get it for free, no matter what the final syntax is for template imports, et cetera. So there are a bunch of those kinds of things that we want to resolve before we ship a 1.0 and make it hopefully part of the built-in Ember language server, et cetera. We want the out of the box experience to basically be this just works. And most of all that this just works for anybody who installs it on an Octane or post Octane Ember app or a Glimmer app based on Glimmer 2.0. So there's an RFC that um, Thomas Gossman at Gosi and Dan Freeman are working on co-authoring that will land uh, some of the research that Glint represents as types upstream for the type definitions for Glimmer components. That'll probably be out in like the next month, hopefully sometime in April. Um, so that all the shenanigans, you'll have to go look at the readme to see what I mean. But you have to do some shenanigans with your imports today and they all just work. Um, it's fine, but you have to do some shenanigans with your imports because we had to change the type signature for Glimmer components to make it work. And that's great, but now we have to go do that work. This has been a very long way of saying I have no idea what the timeline for it non -be not being experimental is because... That's you're saying next week. That's yeah, what you're that's saying. That's exactly <laughs> it. Yep, Tuesday, next week, it'll be... No. Um, great. Software timelines, as everybody on the call should know, are always difficult to forecast accurately. That goes double when it's open source, and that goes triple when it's open source and requires us working through a bunch of things in the RFC process and some coordination with, you know, release schedule timelines for future Glimmer component releases, etc. So no definite timeline. Um, my personal hope, and this is, let's be very, very, very clear, personal hope bucket. My hope is that we're there by the end of the calendar year. And I don't yeah, think that's me. an unreasonable hope. Um, but it is very much like hopes and dreams like stuff works you can use it today but getting from where we are to ex from experimental to this ships out of the box it's part of the recommended vs code bundle it's part of our docs that say hey if you're using you know the if you want editor tooling go install ember language server and glint is just part of it or something you know there's a lot to figure out i hope we can get there by the end of 2021 i think we can James, you have anything to add to that? What's that? Uh, yeah, just yeah. basically, I mean, I mean, probably anybody who's tried to use it, like the most like dangerous thing right now is that we have these custom imports, you know, and they work, like we've taken pains to make sure they work, but, <laughs> you know, things could change 
uh, to make them not work at, at, at any moment, you know, and, and we haven't tested all the edge cases and stuff. Um, and then, you know, Chris explained why we why we had to do that. Um, once we can get past that, then things are a little safer because ultimately, I mean, it's it's TypeScript, it's it's build time checking, you know, that's the only thing that like affects runtime and you, I, I don't know if still we would say, oh yes, you should use this in your production apps, but like, you know, people who are okay with having to change things, <laughs> you know, or something right. might be, you know, um, it's kind of like if anybody's uh, done the prettier uh, template stuff, you know, that's been like iterating on and you get weirdness and things don't, you know, but like ultimately that's something that's a dev tool that's not gonna affect your runtime, hopefully, unless it screws up your templates. Uh, similar similar kind of yeah things you know but um but yeah it's really hard to say a a, a, time, a definitive timeline as soon as possible <laughs> Come help us understood everybody <laughs> wants it yep <laughs> yep no understood i mean james um, went up on on stage at emberconf 2019 and said yeah chris is going to work on this because we thought i was and then priority shifted internally and nope you didn't <laughs> yep Does anybody else have questions here? I'm not seeing anything in the chat. What does official TypeScript support in Ember mean? Uh, you should read the RFC, James. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? There's a dozen coming, it looks like. I mean, like. so far, there are only two. Yeah. <laughs> the, big ones. Um, they keep promising big. more. Uh, there will be more. Seconds. There will be uh -huh. at least four more, I think, um, that we know of at this point to kind of flush out the rest, of, flush out the rest of the story. Flush and flesh are different words. Um, are we going to so, have an index of RFCs? Yes, yes. <laughs> the the actual goal is the top level RFC will link to all the others when we're done. Um, so that was a good leading question, James, and I like it. James, of course, knows the answer. Um, official TypeScript support in Ember. Uh, does not actually mean typed template support. I mean, we hope those land around similar times, like making Glint built into Ember CLI seems like a good thing we would like to do long-term so that if you're opting in, it's trivial to do. But official support means that at the most high-level summary, when Ember goes to think about adding features, it needs to consider the impact to TypeScript users as well as JavaScript users. It means that to, to break the types is a breaking change and we can't do that. It means that when we ship the next edition, the edition won't be done until the TypeScript story is done. Just like we said, some of the Octane features were ready sooner, but until all the doc story was ready, until we had rewritten the guides to really fully account for the change in mental model and all of that, it needs, you know, the docs had to be updated. The same thing will be true for TypeScript. The full story, including migration, like what's the path for migrating from these types to those types? Let's say that we have a story where we say we've deprecated that set of type signatures and we're using this new set of type signatures. I alluded a couple minutes ago to the fact that we need to change the type signature for Glimmer components arguments so that we can support providing types for named blocks and for the element. And if in the future we add support for validating the attributes that you can pass to a component, um, we, we need to change the type signature to do that. If Ember officially supports TypeScript, then thinking about our migration story for TypeScript types is part of that. Even though those don't impact your app at runtime, if we just change those between Ember 4.4 and 4.5, well, all of a sudden we've broken your app in the sense that you can't build your app anymore. And that is not how Ember does things. Um, so basically official support means that our docs will support TypeScript, will include TypeScript. Our tooling will work out of the box with TypeScript, whatever that means, RFCs forthcoming for both of those things. That breaking changes are defined in ways that account for TypeScript, that uh, API design for new features, uh, will account for TypeScript and likely will from now on be authored with TypeScript types as here is the actual type, here's what we'll actually be implementing, etc. 
And then that requires us to solve a bunch of other problems because TypeScript, the compiler and language does not do semantic versioning. Ember obviously does semantic versioning. Uh, we're very serious about semantic versioning. We try very hard not to break things. Whereas TypeScript had breaking changes between 4.1 and 4.2. Uh, 4.2 is the most recent release of TypeScript. And they just said, yep, here's a breaking change. We think it won't affect too many people. Here's the mitigation and the migration strategy. So if Ember is going to have an official TypeScript support policy, one of the things we need to be able to do is say, given this support policy, what ranges of TypeScript support are of what range of TypeScript versions does Ember support? So an open question there is, for example, if we were to ship, this is a big hypothetical, but if we were to ship TypeScript support with Ember 4.0, does that mean that we then support whatever versions of TypeScript we support when Ember 4.0 comes out for the entire lifetime of Ember 4? Dot X. And the reason that matters, let's think about the lifetime of Ember 3.x. Personally, I hope 4.x is a shorter life cycle than 3.x was because we're going to be like 3.28 at least. And by my math, that is 168 weeks. That's three full years. That's a long time. In that span, we went from early or late mid to late TypeScript 2.x series all the way through the TypeScript 3.x series into now the TypeScript 4.x series. And even though those numbers aren't meaningful the way our numbers are, there were a bunch of features in TypeScript that came out in the 3.x and now early 4.x series of TypeScript that we would really, really, really like to be able to use. But if we say Ember 4, the entire 4.x series can only use TypeScript you know, features that work all the way up to TypeScript 4.3, which would be what's out, then we're stuck for 18 months, two years, three years, whatever the life cycle of Ember 4 ends up being. So we need a policy to absorb that. And what I'm probably going to propose after many, many discussions over the last three years with Rob and Chris Garrett and Yehuda, um, I say Rob, for anyone on the call, that's RWJ Blue. Rob Jackson, basically the guy who I'm not sure how he does everything he does, um, and who who really makes sure we do Sember well. Um, what we're probably going to propose, and we'll have to see what the community's response is, is a rolling support window where you can upgrade across two Ember LTS versions without having to upgrade your supported TypeScript version. Um, because that lets you say, hey, I can bump Ember LTSs, and then later I can bump TypeScript and vice versa. And that gives you the ability to decouple those. What we never, ever, ever want somebody to do is have to upgrade TypeScript to get from Ember 4.4 to 4.8. Never, ever, ever. Now, it may be the case that you have upgraded to 4.4 and you need to upgrade TypeScript first and then migrate to 4.8 on Ember or something like that. But we never ever want it to be that you have to make both of those changes at the same time for your app to keep building. And the community may push back. The community may actually end up saying, no, we think it stability is important enough that you should just support TypeScript 4.3 for the entire life cycle. Um, maybe that's the outcome of that. But the other is what I'm going to propose because I think it gives us the best benefit of um, long-term stability over the life cycle of Ember 4 and then 5 and whatever, as well as benefits of being able to adopt new TypeScript versions. And to be clear, this isn't a novel idea. This is exactly the policy we have with Node-supported LTSs. We support Node's LTSs with Ember and Ember CLI and Ember Data, and we test every change against those. And when a Node LTS goes out of cycle, we drop it. Now, in our case, we'd be defining basically an LTS policy for TypeScript of our own because they don't have one. But if we do this rolling window approach, it would work very similarly to the node process. It also works almost identically to the new browser support process. And that was some of the other inspiration for it. And it gives us that ability to have stability without having stagnation. And I, I really want to lean into the without stagnation part here because we could, we could over-index on stability and be like, well, we're stuck on TypeScript 4.1 for three years. I don't want that, but we need to solve the other problem. So see also the 
RFC I posted, which defines semantic versioning for TypeScript, including proposing here are two strategies for supported versions, the rolling window policy I just described, as well as the, if you make a change to your supported, like if you drop a supported version, that's a breaking change policy. Both of those will be options for the community to use. Uh, libraries, TypeScript libraries I maintain use the simpler version, not the supported kind of rolling window policy. Um, like if I drop a TypeScript version, that's a breaking change. Just like if I drop a Node version, that's a breaking change. And I think most add-ons in the community will be well advised to do that. It's the same way most add-ons treat Node. And I think that's very clear and helpful. Um, so that was a, another 10 minute answer to a question. Thank you, James. Uh, but I think it's worth uh, having all of that out there because those are all the kinds of things we're trying to think about. And one of the pieces of that is having tests for our types. One of the reasons I don't know the timeline for Ember official support, even if this RFC gets merged, is then we have to go implement all the types in Ember. Like we have to move them out of definitely typed into Ember. We have to have a story for migrating existing TypeScript users from definitely typed types into Ember types. And we have to have tests in place so that we know if an upcoming TypeScript breaking change breaks us. It doesn't always, but it can. Long answer. Um, if somebody else would like to ask a question, feel free to do the Zoom raise your hand thing or um, post it in chat, etc. Um, you can click the reactions button in the bottom of Zoom to raise your hand if you have a question, etc. I keep saying etc. I don't know why. While we're waiting for that, would you envision? if there is that rolling change policy for TypeScript, that there would be code mod to aid the community in moving that? Uh, is If and as necessary, yes. So a place where we know there will be a code mod. When we land the, assuming the RFC gets accepted, where we change the types for Glimmer components um, from what they are today, where they just support args, to the future where they also support giving the type of blocks that you yield with named blocks, etc. We'll have a code mod for that. Um, the goal will be in general that end users don't have to do stuff, that mostly we just absorb the change internally in Ember zone types. Uh, but if we get to a point where there's a case where it's like, hey, there's gonna be a weird breaking change here and it is code moddable, um, we will do that. Most likely it'll be more like stuff where it's like, hey, we're using the new node APIs and we've dropped support for that one, but that doesn't usually actually cause breaking changes, even though node does make breaking changes. Most of the time Ember CLI just absorbs those and it's fine and users don't have to think about it. We would aim to do the same kind of thing where our type tests should just keep type checking. Now, maybe we add new functionality that if we were saying we could only support TypeScript 4.1, you couldn't do that. You couldn't use new features of the compiler because they wouldn't emit the same types for users, etc. But we would have the same kind of stability guarantees where all your type tests should continue passing without modification. You've upgraded TypeScript supported versions, but you haven't you haven't made a breaking change there. You've just said we no longer have to support features that only exist back there. So the equivalent from Node would be Ember CLI's public API didn't change when we dropped support for Node 8 or 10. But along the way, we got to start using async await in Ember CLI add-ons and everything else, because I don't remember that it was node 10 or 12, I think it was 10 added support for async await. Um, well, now you can use that. And if we said, no, we're going to only use features that work with whatever was the first LTS node version that Ember CLI 3 shipped with, we'd be stuck with either six or eight. I think it was 8.x, but that means we would never ever be able to use async await in Ember add-ons. So the rolling support policy gives you a way to say, ah, oh, we can adopt new features, but we're going to do that in a way that doesn't break your types. It doesn't, just like switching to node 10 didn't break your add-on. Like you opted into, or your app, you upgraded to node 10 and Ember CLI had already taken care of all the breaking changes in node for you. We would approach type definitions exactly the same way. I think um, one example that kind of demonstrates this that we discussed was, uh, I believe, 
there was a version of TypeScript that changed the defaults um, mm -hmm. for certain types of generics uh, in certain locations. Uh, so like whether it would default to unknown or something like that for, or any, right? Um, it became more strict because they introduced things like unknown into the language. Uh, and that's like a, just a generally good thing because, you know, before it was like the Wild West and now things are a little bit more strictly typed by default. Um, but that represents an issue for us because if we weren't providing an explicit default before, now the behavior's changed. So well, we discussed this and in that case, the thing that we would wanna do for Ember uh, is not just adopt the new way of doing things, we would actually want to add an explicit type for whatever the previous behavior was. Mm -hmm. And that would be a backwards compatible change that would also um, make sure that we're doing the same behavior until the next major Ember version, at which point we would change the behavior. Yep. Uh, there's just a small subset of cases where that's just not possible. Like the change that has happened in the new version of TypeScript is not something that we can fix in the older versions of TypeScript. And in those cases, you would have to have some uh, some upgrade, you know, you would have to update uh, when that that feature was no longer usable. Possibly. Um, Though even there, possibly. we've actually designed a, it'll be more work for the maintainers, but I have a design for using a TypeScript feature called types versions, which will allow us to say, uh, if you're on TypeScript up to 4.5, let's just assume that 4. you know, 6 introduces this big breaking change that we can't make a backwards compatible accommodation for. We actually have the ability to say, okay, now we publish two sets of types. One of them is for up to TypeScript 4.5, and the other one is for 4.6 plus. And uh, because our types tell, like our package.json and tsconfig.json will specify here's where to resolve it. So if you're using TypeScript 4.4 and you haven't upgraded yet, you'll get these types automatically. And then once you're across that hump, you'll get these types automatically. And with the rolling support policy, you know, we can stop doing that once we get far enough down the line because you'll have upgraded in that back and forth, stepping back and forth way to get yourself there. But at no point will you have had to manually go change pretty much anything. And if there is a scenario where we can't solve it with either of those, and Dan and James and I have spent a lot of time thinking about it, and we haven't come up with an example where we couldn't solve it with one of those. Also, Chris, also, we've talked with Mike North off and on over the years. I, I don't think we've found a scenario where we couldn't use one of those solutions. Then we would provide like code mod and guidance or something. Um, or we can, and we will reserve the right to do this, say that's not a supported version. Um, because, and, and we may do that for other reasons. For example, I want to say TypeScript 3.1 through 3.3 were unusable with Ember's types. Um, there were, there was a very bad performance regression and I know at least 3.1 and 3.2, but I think it lasted up until they released 3.4. They were just straight up not usable. And so Ember gets to define its support policy. Ember can say, we support 2.9, 3.0, 3.1, we don't support or 3.0, we don't support 3.1 or 2 or 3. And then when 3.4 comes out and fixes the bug, we support that now. Um, but we're going to do the right thing for our end users of the framework, not uh, not leave people hanging. That, that would be kind of equivalent to like, we don't support a version of a browser that has a serious security bug security or something like. Yep. It's just like, we there, there are certain specific versions that just get to the latest version where we're not gonna support that version. Yeah. Um, and I, I do think that's totally reasonable. Um, yeah. I like to First. call out here that as I put it in the RFC, semantic versioning is not a machine enforceable or totally machine knowable thing. It's a socio-technical contract. And what I mean by that is there's a technical aspect of it, of we can expose this information to tooling, but the information that we expose to the tooling is a reification. It is kind of a formalization in numeric terms of a sociological contract that we've all agreed to, which is why we can say, hey, we dropped support for node 10, and that's fine. It's part of the contract we've all agreed to. And this is where we actually disagree with Microsoft about whether like bug fix changes are breaking changes to a compiler. Like 
No, everybody understands what a bug fix means. Like, yes, it breaks somebody's code somewhere, but we've all agreed to this socio-technical contract. It's fine. We're all on the same page. Different philosophical points of view there, but that's our point of view as an Ember community, and I think broadly as the JavaScript community. Same thing for the Rust community and the Ruby community. There's a lot of similarities in how we think about these things. Um, yeah, that's also going back to like the type versions thing. That's also the way that if we did decide we wanted to do the whole thing, uh, we could support every version. Like you said, I, as a maintainer though, I yeah. do think like doing that would be, it is possible, but it, it would slow us down significantly. And that's why I think this rolling window does make a lot of sense. Um, at least in terms of still being able to move forward as a community what without you know constantly being dragged back by older code we have to maintain um so that's that's why i feel like the rolling window does make a lot of sense but i i'm interested to see what other community members think i'm gonna open this up to the floor again does anybody else have questions i still have more but i don't have to be the only one asking them We have crickets. Um, next question for me then. Cue them up, folks. Uh, blueprints. We've had snags with blueprints for a while. That is what happens with those? <laughs> um, so there's a is there anything blocking that? Is that something people can help with? Is that, uh, please don't touch that right now. There's too much else moving. Um, I think if somebody has the bandwidth, we know the rough shape. Like Rob and I talked about what we wanted the rough shape of this solution to be two years ago. But you may have noticed that at our WJ Blue is a little bit busy. <laughs> um, and as the I've been the Octane lead for LinkedIn.com, the flagship app at LinkedIn. So I've also been a little bit busy. Um, and what needs to happen there, Nullvox Populi in the community has started work on a design for this that is what Rob and I have both wanted to see happen. Um, and I think Jan and James have also chatted with us about this along the way. I just don't remember who's been in which conversation. So I'm not being like, I want to just be very clear that Type Ember is, I'm off in the face of it because I'm the loud one, but it's very much a collaboration. There's a lot of DMing each other of, does, does this work? I don't know if this works. And Dan and James, uh, like Glint is 100% them so far, for example. Mm -hmm. So while I talk a lot, that's mostly just because I'm the really loud talker one. Um, we've all been brainstorming this and the rough shape of the solution is we want to treat it the same way we treat um, almost like we treat code mods. We want it to basically be an AST transform and preferably one that's built on uh, the same mechanics we use for the build. So what we want to do, and this is a little tricky because of like the interpolation stuff, and there'll be an ordering thing we have to figure out as a result. But I think what we ultimately will want to do if we adopt official TypeScript support, because I think this will be the easiest way to do it, is if you are in a TypeScript enabled repo, well, let me take a step back. We will have the blueprints, the way I would envision it is the blueprints will be in TypeScript because all we have to do is run the generator mode and then run Babel's strip types and mm -hmm. probably then run prettier on the results so that what you end up with looks reasonable. Um, but you can do all of that programmatically and you can say then the base is TypeScript and then you have the ability to run arbitrary-ish AST transforms on the result of generating any given blueprint. And the built-in one will be, if you're in a JavaScript only app that doesn't have the TypeScript flag set or however we design that, then we'll just run the strip types Babel transform when we're done generating your thing. And here you go. And it just works. Um, the, the other thing that does is it enables us to provide that experience to other uh, library authors, if you want to provide some other arbitrary AST transform, where you say, in our app, we always want to add this to a new component. If you have the ability to, yeah, um, agreed. Chris just put in the chat that it should also run prettier. We agree. Uh, so that you have well formatted output when you're done. But if you have the ability to run effectively arbitrary, albeit ordered AST transforms on the output, 
that benefits lots of people, not just TypeScript, because there are lots of things that you can do with just strings, but it gets awfully finicky to like post-process a template today. If the way it works is you're like, here's my generator and here's the output of the generator and you can just chain a series of Babel AST transforms off of it or SWC or ES build or whatever else you want to integrate into your pipeline because you just get back a, you know, a string or maybe an AST, etc. You've got enormous flexibility there. A hand, Brian. <laughs> Yo, um, uh, this may be an interesting question. Um, I think for the most part, you've talked about uh, TypeScript for the application layer for kind of the public facing part. What about for Ember CLI? Yes, so we want that. Um, it is probably not a blocker for official support. Actually thinking about it, the way we've defined it, that's not true. Um, Ember CLI will need to be supported because the way we're defining official support is everything that is installed as part of the default blueprint will need to ship types. Ember CLI is part of the default blueprint. Um, it's very much part of the default blueprint because you literally can't today build an Ember app without building Ember CLI. Now it's actually possible that will not be true in two years. Like Embroider unlocks a lot of possibilities long-term that way. Um, but for today, yes, Ember CLI will need to ship types out of the box for Ember CLI itself. Now, how that impacts, for example, the rest of the Broccoli ecosystem, uh, that's, you know, they're not installed as part of the default blueprint, so they're not required to. That said, most of the folks who work in the Broccoli ecosystem at this point like TypeScript for this very reason and for collaboration, etc. So that part of the ecosystem has already slowly been moving that way. Uh, in a lot of cases, haven't published types for the same reason that a number of Ember core libraries haven't published types, even though they're authored in TypeScript. And that is because we don't have a story about what that means for stability in Semver, et cetera. Uh, but a, a number of them are ready and Ember CLI itself would definitely need to ship types out of the box. So would Ember CLI, basically the differentiator would be if you're a thing that has a programmatic API. So like, I don't think Someone on the call can tell me I'm wrong, but I don't think Ember CLI update has a programmatic API. It has a CLI interface that you use to run it. Um, Ember CLI update probably doesn't need to ship types accordingly. Now, if it introduces a programmatic API and it's part of the built-in uh, tooling, then it needs to. But the same thing, like we're going to set up, like we bundle prettier for you. We're not obligated to go provide the prettier types. Now I think prettier has types, et cetera, but we're not supplying prettier to you as a consumer to run via the programmatic interface. And even if we were like, that's a third party thing. I don't think we're obliged there, but as a CLI, we don't care about whether it has types in the interface or not. Like you just type prettier dash dash right and do the thing. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. And do we have a meta issue written up on the AST stuff that kind of pitched the I vision for what we're after there? I think Nullbox Populi has written a pre RFC or something like that. Um, somebody should poke at that after this uh, call because I know he had started work on it. Like, I think he had spiked out an initial implementation or something like that. So. Here's hoping uh, that that's still around floating somewhere, floating around somewhere. Yeah, sort of thinking out loud, this would be super handy for some of the places where we do template transforms and some other yep. gnarly stuff in the build. Yep. Now you'd said you needed to wrap up at one. I don't have a hard limit. I just wanted to make sure everybody has time. I believe the first session proper starts at 1.30 PST, right? Or PDT, I should say. Mm believe that's correct so yeah i'll say let's put a hard stop at 115 pacific so another 15 minutes i'm happy to go for that um, but i want to make sure everybody has a time for bio break before the sessions start this afternoon for the bonus material sounds good uh this is a slight change of topic anybody else have a question before i do so we're not seeing hands um decorators do we want to get into that on a recorded call? Or should yeah, I just I'm happy to, go actually. Um, so number one, I'll say the situation with decorators is there's nothing about them that is 
a serious blocker for us. Um, there are things that we certainly would like to be better. Like if, so to give some context to everybody on the call, the JavaScript decorator spec is now five and a half, almost six years old. I want to say Yehuda first proposed it in May, 2015. Um, it's been a long time baking. Um, it got adopted, a variant of it got adopted by TypeScript as part of their decision to help the Angular team not create their own custom fork of JavaScript. Uh, some of you may remember the at script thing that Angular 2 was building, which was basically a superset of JavaScript that had decorators built in, among other things. It was a terrible idea. Um, and they figured that out. And they also wanted to layer it on top of TypeScript. I think there was probably at some point, I don't know any details here, but I think there was probably at some point a conversation between Google and Microsoft. And this was a much earlier, younger TypeScript program. And TypeScript implemented decorators. And in TypeScript's defense, they implemented decorators as decorators looked like they were moving along. And the, the ECMAScript process was different than it is today. Um, decorators made it to stage two and everybody expected them to just keep moving forward because there had up to that point seemed to be good <laughs> consensus. But at that point, decorators in Babel and decorators in TypeScript had a different implementation. And this could end you up in really, really, really weird, bad places at runtime if you use the TypeScript compiler to emit some code that ran with decorators and the Babel compiler to emit other code that ran with decorators because they weren't the same under the hood. They transpiled to different things. Ask me how I know about this ping. Because Chris Garrett and I had to work through all of this uh, in the early Ember 3 days as we were trying to get to native class support in Ember. Because prior to Ember 3.6, when we got to the right solution for the entire shape of native classes, great work to Chris there and props to the TypeScript ado early adopters in the Ember community who basically were the ones who found all the bugs um, very painfully. We worked out that what we actually need to do, and therefore what Ember CLI TypeScript does today, is have Babel manage to uh, Babel to do all of the emit. That is, Babel is responsible for all of the transpiling work we do. And TypeScript is only involved as a type checker. And what this means is that we have a single, stable, in. consistent output like for the uh, actual decorators that we run at runtime. The other piece of it is that from that early point, in part because the decorator spec proved so unstable, TypeScript said decorators are not allowed to affect the type of whatever is actually, you know, here in the code. So you can write a decorator, but if you don't apply a type to it, it's just any or unknown or whatever your compiler settings say it is. And given that, it, there are things we have to write by hand that we can know statically. The primary example today is that you can know statically looking at a piece of code that at service foo resolves to foo service. We know that because um, especially if you opt into the strict Ember resolver, which is built on all public API, but it gives you a stricter lookup uh, for services, component invocations, etc. We use it internally at LinkedIn. Uh, you can know exactly how the uh, service will be resolved. So we could, in theory, we have enough information right there, just say, here's the type. But we can't do that because decorators don't give us the relevant information. So we're not doing that yet. Our hope is that as Chris Garrett, hero of all things decorators, continues to work with ECMAScript and TC39 on the decorators spec, that will get to a point when the decorator spec actually becomes a spec. And when it gets to stage three or four, we, I think TypeScript will implement. Um, they implemented, they've been implementing it things at stage three uh, because stage three means it's, you know, barring a major, major, major issue, this is what's gonna be there. It has to have implementers in browsers already to get to stay, um, to advance. And then it's basically just, yep, we're done, we've finalized. So they will probably do it, and we'll probably get to have nicer things then. Chris, it looked like you wanted to 
comment on. I just I expect if it moves to stage three after all this time, it'll have me more pretty sure. <laughs> yeah. um, the biggest blocker has been implementers uh, worried about performance concerns. Um, and the latest version of the proposal that we're working on does address those performance concerns with minimal changes to um, the existing spec, although there will be changes. Um, at It'll least be code modable, don't worry. Yes. Um, so yeah, and just to, I, I you kind of talked about it, but I just wanted to like clarify a bit more. Basically, Ember only supports the Babel version of the decorators transform. Yes. That there was an RFC specifically for this uh -huh. that states what we support. Um, but it is we only support the stage one legacy Babel transform. Uh, and uh, that means that if you use TypeScript transforms, they may work. Uh, in some cases, they, they will not work in all to. cases. Yep. Yes, they, they're not guaranteed to, and they will not work in all cases. And um, that, especially recently, since TypeScript has begun updating um, their, uh, like the way that class fields work, which fundamentally changed as well, um, like a lot of TypeScript decorators libraries started breaking uh, yep. pretty recently. Um, so yeah, all of our TypeScript support will be based on uh, using the Babel transforms rather than the uh, the TypeScript versions. Yeah, so we and, will always do for the foreseeable future Babel for compile to actually yeah. generate the target JavaScript and TypeScript only for type checking. And that's how Glint works as well. Glint is completely uninvolved, both as a language server and a build tool in generating output. All it does is type check for you. The thing is that there there are some really useful features that you can't actually use uh, using the yep. Babel version. The biggest one I come think of frequently is const enums. Um, if you yep. don't know what they are, they're a really useful tool uh, in large code bases in particular for defining like constant values um, and then reusing those constant values everywhere. And basically, a const enum like turns into that exact value everywhere you use it. Um, and this is super valuable for performance because then you're doing a comparison against the real value and not looking it up off of an object every single time, for instance. Um, but what we've, we were talking about this, I think relatively early on and what we realized was like, that's, that's essentially like an optimization that you can, if you are, uh, you know, Ember data, or you are Ember, or you are some other large library, and you're finding that you need those performance optimizations, you can add those. You, you can buy, build TypeScript locally yourself and just be aware that like, oh, decorators need to be handled specially and figure out how to do that. Um, and that's something that, uh, especially with all the other work that's going on with Embroider, basically you would build TypeScript yourself before you publish as a normal add-on or a normal NPM package. And then Embroider would just consume you like a normal NPM package. And that's kind of like where that's overall heading. Um, yep. So the the average developer will just use the Babel version. It'll be very simple uh, overall. It'll compile ahead of time using Babel. And then more advanced uh, use cases can always customize their own build chain you could use things like roll up too. you know, there's like lots of other tools you might want to use uh, to optimize your specific library. But for most users, it just won't, won't matter. And that's how we want it to be. Yes. We're actually does it look also like the decorator stack is actually going to move ahead based on the optimizations that you put in, or is it still, that's unclear. So I just, at this point, I need to write the spec and that's actually what I'm doing this week I'm starting on. Um, because uh, the implementers have said that they are not gonna review it again until the spec is written, which is totally fair. So we have, for the first time since the last, the stage two version was shot down, we have consensus on the 
working group side of things uh, of a spec. Like we have all of the frameworks, everybody involved agreeing to a particular direction, a particular spec that satisfies the constraints we were given. Um, so assuming those constraints were given in good faith, which I think they were, uh, once I finish up writing this spec, we can bring it to committee and see what happens there. At that point, it's it's kind of, who knows, we, we've raised the current proposal a couple times in committee, gotten mixed responses. Um, and I think it is possible that they'll want changes. Um, one possibility is I actually think it could be possible that the implementers say, you know what, the weird things we're doing for performance reasons aren't actually that important. Like let's let's go with something that's slightly more dynamic, slightly less statically analyzable, but way better for ergonomics. That's basically kind of the trade-off is that there are certain um, use cases today that are gonna be slightly less ergonomic because we wanted to make them more statically analyzable uh, effectively, like so that when the JavaScript engine first parses a class with decorators, it can just understand what that decorator is doing on a basic level. Um, so I, like I said, I'm optimistic. I think that uh, once I get it written and actually present <laughs> it, um, there probably will be another round of debate, but we can actually make progress. Um, so, yeah. There will be infinite rounds of debate, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> the debating will be will continue until progress is made. Sure. Sure. We have five-ish minutes left. So anybody else have some questions here that we can try to answer? Well, maybe we should wrap up early then. Time script, best script. Well. well, thanks for doing this, guys. Yeah. It's useful to have this information out there. Our pleasure. I will upload the recording to YouTube sometime today once it's all done its thing. And hopefully that'll be useful to folks who weren't able to come. And Ah, Alex, that is a very good question, because this is a question that people will ask. Are we deprecating JavaScript in Ember then? As Rob says, no, say it with me, everybody. We are not deprecating Ember in JavaScript. So this is actually a really important question and the perfect way to close. Angular did this. Angular, like theoretically, you can write an Angular app in JavaScript, but basically you cannot. We are not doing that. All we are doing is adding yeah i know i know it's a joke but um i think it's a, a great thing to be really really super extra explicit about because there is misunderstanding out there about this the first long comment on the rfc was someone who clearly misunderstood this from it um and i do want to be really really clear about it we are improving the story for everyone including javascript only users um and we will extra improve it like if you're a typescript user you will get double extra yeah, that's right. Rob says progressive enhancement done well. And that's exactly the language I've been using to talk to people about it as well. If you're a TypeScript user, you get more extra benefits. But as a JavaScript user, you're going to actually see benefits from this. JavaScript authoring in Ember will get better as a result of what we're doing. And TypeScript authoring in Ember will get extra better. But we are not planning ever. The typed Ember team has no interest in ever like pushing JavaScript down or away. We want it to always be a positive sum activity that things that benefit TypeScript users also benefit JavaScript users, even if maybe it's just less. But that is a core constraint for us as a team, always has been. And that's very well aligned with everything we know from talking to framework core team members and steering team members, et cetera. Everybody just wants this to be a positive sum outcome for everybody. I like the joke question because it let me get all ranty about that for a minute. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop the recording and we'll see you around EmberConf.